looks like we're winding down, so we might as well get started because I think we only have until 1 o'clock. Uh, first, let me welcome you. I know graduation was the day before, and here you are in mid throes at the beginning of summer school. So first, I want to thank you so very much for joining us today. Our little presentation today is uh, comes to you courtesy of the American Bar Association. You as law students and maybe uh, you law school grads certainly have the ability to be a member of the ABA, and there's so much that's available to you by way of resources and otherwise, specifically networking. So we do encourage you to think about that. And the General Practice Solo and Small Firm Division is one of the largest sections of the ABA. And we're fortunate that we have our chair with us today, Laura Farber, who's chair of our division. And um, we just really appreciate you taking the time. Our topical area today is how to get a job in a small firm. Now, so many of you are going to be putting out a shingle. Some people are going to go into government practice. Uh, some people are going to go in-house with corporation. Uh, when you look at the data, many, many law students are coming out and going into solo and small firm practice. So the program today is designed to give you just some little tidbits of information to help, help you on your way through that journey. We are delighted today with the panel that we have, and I'm going to have them each introduce themselves, but I'll just generally just... just We'll start here with Laura Farber, Farber, who's a principal at Hahn and Hahn in Pasadena, California. Next to her is an alumnus <laughs> of the law school, and that's Christy Farginoli with Clawson and Stops right here in Charleston. And next to her is I.S. Levy Johnson, who's with Toll and Baptiste in Columbia, South Carolina. And finally, Rami Nakamura is a Ricky Perlani, who's in the Perlani Law Firm, and she's from Tampa, Florida. My name is uh, Pamela Brown. I'm a trial judge in Ellicott City, Maryland, and uh, I do a little bit of everything. Our courts, we have two appellate courts and two courts of general jurisdiction, so I'm the lower of the two courts. I'm going to start with my introduction. I went to undergraduate school in Minnesota, a place called McAllister College in St. Paul, and then I went to law school at the University of Baltimore School of Law. I've been uh, on the bench for 10 years. Prior to that, I did have a private practice. I was in the Maryland Attorney General's office, as well as the city solicitor's office, which represented um, the city of Baltimore. And I also had a private practice, which was permitted when I was practicing in the uh, city solicitor's office. So with that, I'll turn to Laura and ask for where you went to law school and where your practice located in your area of practice. Sure. Uh, I went to UCLA undergrad, and then for law school, I went to Georgetown, so I wanted to try the East Coast uh, to see what that was like. And the weather was interesting and challenging, but other than that, it was a likely place to go to school. And then I, I worked my way back to California, sat the bar there, and started at a big firm. Some of you have heard of this firm. It's been in the news lately. Uh, Dewey Valentine, <laughs> uh, which I don't know if it's still around at this as we speak, but I, it looks like it may no longer be around at some point, unfortunately. I worked there for a couple of years. It was a, a big law firm with a small office. And that's as long as I lasted, it was two years. It was a wonderful experience, great training. But I soon realized that if I wanted to do the kind of things that I'm now able to do, I would no longer be able to work in that environment. So I found this delightful firm, a small firm in Pasadena, California, called Han and Han. It's actually an old firm. We have about 18 lawyers. And uh, I am the hiring partner. I have been for uh, quite a while. And I practice in the area of employment and other types of civil litigation. I'm actually a plaintiff's lawyer. My firm lets me do that work, which I'm very excited about, uh, because nobody else in the firm does it except for me. Uh, but I really enjoy it. And I've done contract work, uh, real estate, business disputes, and collective mix of, of litigation. And employment, I do both plaintiff and defense, which I think is a little unusual as well. Uh, but once again, I, I enjoy the plaintiff work. And they let me do the Bar Association. I'm very active. American Bar Association. And the other little thing I do is a tournament of roses, which is our local, a little event we put on with a roast parade in January 1. Christy. Uh, I'm Christy Farnoli. I went here to Charleston Law, um, graduated in 2008. And uh, my first summer, I clerked at a big firm um, here in town that has you know, offices everywhere and all that. And I really enjoyed it. But one thing that was disappointing was that I didn't really see a lot of attorneys going to trial or going depositions and motions and things like that. So the next summer I sort of focused in on trying to get a job at a firm that was a little smaller. And I did that. I got a job at Clawson Stops for the summer and uh, thank God they hired me. And that's where I am now. Um, I love it. Um, 
I do civil litigation, mostly insurance defense, but a lot of business litigation, things like that, and it's a blast. Uh, good afternoon. My name is I.S. Levy Johnson. Uh, I practice law in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, I've been practicing uh, for 43 years. I literally have been practicing because I've never perfected it. Um, uh, I have a, uh, a doorknob practice. That means anybody who turns a doorknob, I, I try, to help, try to help them. Uh, I'm primarily a litigator. I, I do uh, both civil uh, and criminal work, I do plaintiffs and defense work, uh, and um, it, it's been a very rewarding and uh, challenging career. I've enjoyed it immensely. I'm Rachel Carlani. I have my own firm, small firm out of Tampa, Florida. I went to law school at the University of Minnesota, and I've been lucky enough to practice law all across the country. I started my career practicing high-profile litigation and entertainment law in Beverly Hills. I went up to Tahoe and did small town practice, and then I practiced in-house with Wells Fargo. I was assistant general counsel with them, and also um, with Countrywide Mortgage, and I've also been a partner at a large firm in Dallas. Um, I finally just had enough of it and opened my own practice about four years ago. We were named Small Business of the Year three years after we opened, and we're just growing rapidly, and I really enjoy being the general practitioner and having my own practice, so I'm happy to be here, and I'm I guess I'm going to turn back to you and just ask you, what is one piece of advice, and I'll ask all the panelists that you give to a graduating law student that is seeking to look for practice in a small firm? I, I believe the, there are three components to being uh, successful in the practice of law. What you know, who you know, and who knows you. Lawyers are in the business of selling advice. And the advice you give is based on what you know. We live in an open, information-oriented society. And when a person comes to you, they are looking for you to provide them information about their legal problem. And what they do is they come into your office burdened down with a problem that you can help solve with your legal advice. And so what they do is transfer the, the burden off their shoulders to your shoulders, and what you do is charge them a transportation fee for the transfer from your shoulders, from their shoulders to your shoulders. And unless you have knowledge of the law, you are not going to be able to get a job. The second thing is, the first thing is what you know, the second thing is who you know. The practice of law involves relationships and procedure, and it's important to succeed in the practice of law is for you to know people and know their roles and, and know the, the definition of what they do. And so when you apply for a job, it is important for you to impress upon the potential employer that not only are you knowledgeable about the law, but you are knowledgeable about people, and you're knowledgeable about agencies, and you're knowledgeable about the process. And the third thing, is not only what you know, and know, uh, and, and know people, but the challenge in life is giving definition to your name. That is to say that people will know who you are. When they hear your name, they will have positive thoughts, and they will have a good impression that you move around in, in your sphere of activities once they hear your name, or that you're coming to court, or that you're coming to appear before an administrative agency that they will know that you are a person who are knowledgeable, that you know what you're doing. And so, if you, if you hear the name of Johnny Cochran, for example, don't you have positive thoughts? If you hear the name of, of, of a lot of people, you might have negative thoughts. So what you, the challenge in life, I think, is that when you come into a situation of applying for a job, that you, you are able to say that you know people, and that they know you, and th those are the key things to success. I still think that appearance makes a difference. You heard it said that you can't judge a book by its cover. I.S. Levy Johnson says to you that you've never seen a good book with a bad cover. 
You can go to any bookstore now, and you will see that they spend millions of dollars on the cover of the book. Now, the fact that it's a good cover doesn't always mean the contents is good, but you never find a good book without a good cover. So I still think that appearances um, is important, and people make every day millions of dollars simply based on appearance. I'm gonna, I just want to add something, I'll turn to Laura, then Chrissy, and then Rinky. What uh, Mr. Johnson just indicated, as a trial judge, I see every day. Ladies and gentlemen, when you're coming to court, it's not appropriate for a guy just to have a sport jacket on and some khakis. It's not appropriate for a woman, I see all these beautiful sandals and flip-flops, to come in with sandals and flip-flops. And quite candidly, I've been in practice for over 30 years, and when I first started, we, all the women had this little book called Dress for Success. When I first started practicing law, you always had a navy blue or a black suit, and we always wore these little Joseph Banks escort collars. Now that's all changed. So yes, you're permitted to wear a, a tasteful um, suit or, or pants suit or whatever, but it really isn't appropriate to come in, and, and, and for me, with just a skirt on and a top. I mean, you could be walking to Walmart in a skirt and a top. You're coming to court. So the whole thing about first impressions is so critical that, you know, he said about you've got to know what you're doing. Yes, but you've got to realize as young attorneys, you're not always going to know what you're doing. That's fine. As long as you're committed to trying to get as much information as possible. I always tell new lawyers, I teach a professionalism class, it's really important for you to meet my bailiff, to meet my courtroom clerk, and you may wish to say to them, and you can also say to me, you could ask with the other side to approach the bench, and say, Your Honor, it's a pleasure. You don't have to say it's a pleasure to be in front of you, but you could. And that um, uh, you know you are, are newly admitted to the bar. And I, because somebody told me that, and I used that for the first four years I was out of practice, because really the first four years is a learning curve. So wherever you go, whether it's Columbia, Charleston, you know, wherever it is, you know, you need to make let the judge know who you are. And so with that, Laura, do you have anything else to share about? I, um, I do. Um, and by the way, I have to go on this dress thing. I think we, we started a theme here. Um, I recently tried a case, and the jury really pays attention, <coughs> maybe a little more than they need to, to the lawyers. Um, I say that sometimes because I've actually served as a juror, too. Try that sometimes. It's a fabulous opportunity. If you get that chance, I really encourage you to do it. Anyway, I was very conscious of what I was wearing, what I looked like. Uh, everything from a watch, I mean, you may not believe the things that they pay attention to, but you know how professional you are, how you treat the other lawyers that you're having a case with, um, how you treat the judge, how respectful you are in the process, how you present yourself, how you carry yourself, which is, I think, what everyone is, is the theme here that is being conveyed. Really, really important, because at the end of the day, I want them to see me as an advocate, but not to focus on me. I want them to focus on what I'm saying, on what I'm conveying, and why my client should win this case, and why I'm advocating for my client, and not get caught up in, oh gosh, did you see those shoes or that pants that she got? I mean, these jurors really focus on things that kind of are, uh, maybe you won't be shocked to find out, but you really don't want to be part of the equation. You want to just, in that sense, you want to just be professional and present your best foot forward. Which goes to one of my tips. What you want to do when you're trying to find a job, with either solo or small, is uh, distinguish yourself. What makes you unique? I mean, I get tons of resumes uh, that come in. You know, I'd like to get a job with your firm. Okay, so you read the paper. Does something stand out? Is there something special about this person? Also, don't um, minimize the impact of personal connection, meaning a piece of paper is great, a phone call is great, but if I can meet somebody, that will carry a much bigger, uh, bigger weight with me, um, whether it be maybe at a bar association event or some other event, or I've had someone you know, ask if I, they can meet me for coffee, for advice, you know. Oh, somebody wants my advice about how to get a job. And the next thing you know, there's a dialogue and maybe some relationship that develops, even if it's a mentor-mentee relationship, whatever it is. You want to get your foot in that door. How do I get my foot in that door? And a lot of folks, you're finding this, it's, it's getting harder and harder to find a job when you graduate from law school, so you've got to get creative. How am I going to get someone's attention? Offer perhaps an intern opportunity. Hey, you know what? I'll come in. I'll do some work for free. Uh, you know, I just want to get to know what the firm is like. And you know, some people might be shocked by that. Really, you're going to come work for free? Well, if you if you get your foot in that door and you impress those folks, 
you've got a better shot at, at, at getting in. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, how am I gonna, what am I gonna see from you that's different from, from you? I mean, what, what's gonna stand out? Well, if I get to know the person and I see what they're able to do, that's gonna have an impact. And then I say, well, you know what? I really wanna have that person around. I think I'll pay them. I'm gonna offer them a job. And the other thing is, ask for a job. Don't be afraid to ask. A lot of folks will kind of hint around and get to it, but they never make the ask. You need to make the ask. If you don't, um, many opportunities that you might have had might pass, might pass by. So um, those, are, those are sort of the general comments I have. I can't minimize the importance of bar association, and I'll keep, keep mentioning this theme, because being involved in the bar as a law student, as a young lawyer, and many uh, bar associations will give you free, ABA gives you first year free, our division will give you um, a first year free, the general practice solo small firm division. You will meet incredibly valuable people. And not just to find a job, but even to get business in the future. I get, I get a good chunk of business from my ABA relationships. That's not why I do the ABA work, but if someone needs a lawyer in Pasadena, California, they don't know anybody, they're gonna call me. And if I can help them, I do. If I don't, I try to get them in the hands of someone that can. But you will make really, really amazing relationships. So that's those are my tips for now. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to give you some really practical <coughs> tips, and this is really on the top of my mind right now because I'm seeing a lot of resumes come across my desk. People are looking for work, and it really sounds simple the way I put it, but you would be surprised how many times I see this. Have you looked up the hiring partner and see if they're a man or a woman? Do you know their name? Do you know how many resumes and letter cover letters I get with Mr. Parwani? I don't even get past the Mr. I put them in the trash. I mean, do a little homework. You know, you, you know, think about that. You know, the first thing I'm seeing is your resume and cover letter. Then I get somebody who sends me a resume from Charleston. Why the heck do you want to come to Tampa? I don't even understand that in the letter. Why would I even want to fly you down to Tampa if I don't know why you want to be here? Do you have family here? Is there some reason you want to practice law here? Tell me why you need to be where, where you want the job. And then, most importantly, I don't ever see this. And if I see a resume or a cover letter with this, that's the first one on my top of my list. What can you do for the firm? And don't say, oh, I've written pleadings and this and that. You haven't done anything, <laughs> you know. It <laughs> really <laughs> happens. <laughs> you know, I, I remember being in your shoes. What can you do to really help that firm? And you have to be flat out honest. You know what, I'm new at, new at this, I'm a new lawyer. Yes, I want to come in and learn, but you know, I want you to know, hiring partner, I'm there to help your firm succeed. I'm going to help on the cases. I'm willing to take out the trash, whatever it is, to make sure this firm succeeds. And when I see that from a law student, I say they've got it together. You know, of course, punctuation and everything else, but you'd be surprised how often that's missed too. So, in, I'm not joking. So, in, you know, in practicality sense, when they say image, that letter that you send, that cover resume, people do look at that. You know, so make sure it's spelled, checked, punctuation, perfect. You know, we're not expecting that you, you know, save the world at this point already or, you know, one million dollar cases or know how to talk to a client. But what I am expecting is that you're detail oriented, you've dotted your I's, you've crossed your T's, and that you're willing to come in at the bottom rung and really get, learn everything there is that you can about practicing law and becoming a successful contributor to the firm. So that's what I would say. And Christy, I'm going to get to you. One of the things that you can do is like, well, how am I going to know anything about this firm? Well, obviously, the, the premier resource is Martindale Hubble. And so you could just take a gander at that. When I spoke a little bit about connection, you know, maybe when that interview, maybe the partner that you're going to interview did something with Eagle Scouts. You, you've got to try to, you know, you have to do your due diligence. So when you go in an interview situation, you know some personal bit of information. Maybe it's calling up the firm, not disclosing who you are. Or I'm not suggesting that you be dishonest, but speak to the staff and, you know, make some kind of inquiry. But all I'm suggesting to you is the personal contact. It also gives you something else to talk about in the interview. And that the person then is, like, very impressed that you knew whatever the little nuance is that you got. Uh, about the person. If you're doing a judicial clerkship, there's something in Maryland called a Maryland uh, manual. So it has our 
Bible of, of judicial officers, what we've been involved in. And so if you're looking for a judicial clerkship, you could look through that to see what boards, commissions they've been on. You know, you've got to make sure your resume is, is good. And quite candidly, if you can do some pro bono, some volunteer work, it's really very, very helpful. And as Laura said, you know, maybe volunteering to just take an internship. That internship, the non-paid internship, now you have something else to put on your resume. That, you know, you know that you were with the firm and this is the kind of work that I did. So I think it's really very important that you be as broad-based as possible. You know, maybe it's going, I don't know if you want to do criminal work or not, but see that the prosecutor's office or the public defender's office, they're so understaffed, they're always looking for support. Just volunteering to take cases to do triage to, you know, there's a variety of things that you can do. And now, a lot of the pro bono projects that are affiliated with both the ABA and others, you don't have to have a license to do that. So you just got to, you know, branch out a little bit. I know that many of you are going into your second or third year. It's tight times, heavy course loads, etc. But try to take on one additional thing during the course of your year, one additional pro bono project or volunteer opportunity. And so you have something else to put in your resume. <coughs> Um, obviously, a lot of good advice has been given already. Um, so I'm going to touch on, I guess, the importance of not only making the connections we talked about, but maintaining them. Um, I think my experience has been that there's, been, there's a big difference between how larger firms hire and smaller firms hire. Larger firms, at least in a traditional economy, I don't know what they're doing now, but they hire more proactively. They say, okay, we've got a five-year plan, we've got a ten-year plan, we're going to hire this many law clerks this year, and as long as they don't screw up big time, we're probably going to hire them as an associate. And every year, they're hiring you know, 10 or more clerks and 10 or more associates. Um, small firms are reactive. They they wait until um, you know, the lawyers in the firm sort of put their hands and, and they need help. And so they're looking for an immediate need to fill an immediate spot. And sometimes it really comes down to who's the last decent person I talk to. Um, we don't have time to go on some America's Got Talent search for the perfect lawyer, unfortunately, sometimes. And twice since I've been in Boston and Stubbs, that's happened. And it's like, who does anyone know that is halfway decent that we can hire right now? And so that's the importance of not only making the connections we've talked about, but maintaining them by following up with, you know, a quick email or something like that, or, you know, coffee. Um, you know, you don't stalk people, but, um, you know, I think that's probably how I got my job. I, I, it was pretty close to stalking, but maybe on the, maybe on the more following up side. But um, I think that's really important if what you're looking for is a job in a small firm or even a mid-sized firm is to sort of realize that at the outset and don't sit back and wait for them to post their jobs. It's probably not going to happen. You know, don't sit and wait for something to come on. Um, I think it's Simplicity or whatever it is that y'all use now um, because they may not post it. It may literally be a matter of a couple emails and a couple phone calls and, and a hire is made like that. So. Just try to stay on people's minds, you know, make the connections and sort of stay out there in my mind. Chrissy, can you give them an, uh, an example of one when you talked about how you were a bit persistent in getting the job of just give, uh, was it coffee, was it a follow-up email? Or yeah, sure. Um, well, I think I said earlier, I clerked there, and at the end of the summer, you know, we had a talk, and I, I told them I'd really like to work there. Of course, you know, I was really hoping they would really hire me before my third year started, so I don't have to worry about it. I was so worried about it. Um, so the third year started and they said, well, we like you, but we don't know if we have a spot. And so, you know, um, I'd wait a couple of weeks and I'd maybe shoot an email and check in. And maybe a couple more weeks would go by and I'd make a phone call. And I think that happened maybe, maybe two or three times before they finally they finally hired me. So, you know, it's kind of, kind of a light touch. <coughs> you don't want to be too aggressive about it. Um, but certainly something to let them know that you're interested and that you really, really want the job. And I think, too, to stress to them, you know, because it is so reactive, they don't have time to really gradually introduce you to the practice of law. I mean, I remember I got sworn in in November, and they wanted me to try a case that night. And I was like, can my mom enjoy this for a minute? You know, like, but they, you know, I think they really like people who are willing to just kind of jump in the union. And um, that's what they do. It's Mr. Johnson, what is the, what do you like most about being in a solo spot? The, uh, the relationship, you, you know everybody in the firm by name, you know their personalities, and this is one thing I need to emphasize, 
every law firm has its personality. So when you are applying or interested in a particular law firm, you need to know something about the persons at the law firm because that will mirror how they approach things and, and, how, and how they do things. And so in, 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 a, in, in a small law firm, uh, an important characteristic is, is teamwork because in a small law firm, you might have a, a code of parents and then a conflict develops. Somebody's got to be willing to step in to substitute for you. Uh, in, in, a, in, in a small uh, law firm, uh, if, if you're representing people, you know, there, there's two types of clients, people and institutional clients. If you're representing people, if you go to a restaurant and the restaurant, the, the food is good, but the service is awful, you won't go back. If you go to a restaurant and the food is awful, but the service is good, you'll go back. So in a small law firm, especially you, if, you, if you're representing people, customer service is still important. And what customers want, as I've indicated from a lawyer, number one, is knowledge of the law, but they want to fight. They want somebody who is an advocate for them. They don't want somebody who is indifferent toward their cause, don't believe in them, don't trust them. When they come to a law firm, they want somebody who will be strongly in their favor. And so a success in a law firm, number one, is a team, a, a team effort. The lawyer, clients want somebody who will, who will fight for them. And the practice of law is not a man five job, five days a week. The practice of the law is hard work. In my, in my, um, um, in, and, and, and you need some quiet time. Um, our office hours from 9 to 5.30, and I, I never leave the office. I've been practicing 43 years, and yesterday was my birthday. I was 70 years old. <laughs> And I'm still at the office 6.30, 7 o'clock, 7.30, 8 o'clock. Isn't that right, George? Yes. <laughs> Actually, I don't know, because I left before you. That's one of my distant relatives, my son. We practice we practice law, law together. Um, I, I got two granddaughters now. And his name is not in the wheel anymore. <laughs> Mark, what do you have to say? What do you like most about being in a small firm practice? I like being able to have um, a little more control over my life. Um, when I worked at that big firm at my little experiment, I found myself driving home at 2 or 3 in the morning, working on a trial continuance that was given to me on a Friday. Said I needed it on a Monday. I've been sitting on this desk, I know for a fact, for days before that, little tests that they put you through or whatever. And I said, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. This is craziness. Um, I, I had been married and rarely saw my husband. I thought, gosh, you know, it'd be kind of cool to see your husband. And, and maybe if I want to have kids, um, you know, that'd be great too. You know? so, um, it, was just, it was just very, very difficult. And I realized I wanted a little more control over my life. And I actually met, um, I was involved with the Women Lawyers Association. And I, um, I had a mentor, and she's the one who introduced me to the person that hired me. And uh, the connection, I, I think, what you were talking about, Christy, in terms of, you know, this firm we're going to advertise. Oh, we're looking for someone. But because of the connection and my experience, although it was only a couple of years and it was the big firm thing, but I was able to get my foot in the door there. And what I love about this place is the fact that I can be a parent. I can, you know, I can... Be with my kids. I actually am able to go to their games and to performances and parent teacher conferences. Yeah, I may do a little bit of work in the evening, and now with technology, it certainly makes it a lot easier to have that flexibility. Um, but I have more control over my life, and I don't want to. I don't want to settle. I, I, and, I, and that's my big advice to you: don't settle. You know, you have your things that you want to do in your life, and you want to be fulfilled. So keep searching until you find that. I mean, yes, in the beginning, you got to get some experience. You got to find a job. But find an environment that works for you. Um, I wanted to be able to, to be with my family, to be involved in the community. And this is a place that actually not only encourages it, but expects their lawyers to be involved in the community. So, oh my gosh, this is foreign to me. I mean, how can they want that? And that's because they want their lawyers to be well-rounded. 
If I'm arguing to a jury, I'm not going to talk down to them. I want to talk with them. What better way to talk with them than to be involved in the community and be with people that are not lawyers and to just talk normal <laughs> uh, without all the legalese. And as a well-rounded lawyer, you actually, I think, are more fulfilled. And you'd think that firms would kind of get a clue about that program because uh, a lot you'd have a lot happier people and, and probably a lot uh, less stress in the profession as a whole. But I found that that place, and I thought at first, no, no, this is this is too good to be true. They're, they're trying to you know, reel me in, and then I'm going to see the sweatshop behind the doors or something. <laughs> it didn't turn out to be that way. And the flexibility has been absolutely fabulous because I really am able to do what I need to do. Um, yes, maybe the hours sometimes are a little odd, you know, after my kids are in bed and doing something that otherwise might not. But it's worked out great. So my big, my my fulfillment is that, and my advice to you is search until you find it because depending on your priorities and what you want to do with your life, there is a place for you or you can create it. You can make it work. <coughs> um, what do I love about I just love practicing law. I enjoy it. I am one of those weird people that if I, you know, there's only one thing, well, two things more that are important to me in practicing law. My children and God. And that's it. I, if I, you know, I have a hard time because I love what I do so much, it's hard for me to stop. I mean, I think you and I were on the plane together, she's like, watch me, I'm, net, you know, on the internet, working away again, and I just love it. And I think part of that is, as you pointed out, finding what fulfills you, because there's so many areas of the law. I mean, I've done them all, so I'm, I'm the poster child. I mean, I started in a law firm in Beverly Hills doing the long hours, you know, working until 2 in the morning, and I loved it. But I look to, you know, who were my role models that were doing that? What were the attorneys like? And, you know, they were bald, and they were miserable, and they were tired. <laughs> <laughs> and I just didn't want to be that. <laughs> I did not want to be, you know, working until 3 in the morning every night. You don't want to be bald. <laughs> Maybe. So then I went to Tahoe, and I said, you know what? I'm going to try this small practice in a small town. This is easy going, you know. Enjoyed it, enjoyed it, but I wasn't getting the intellectual challenge that I was getting maybe in Beverly Hills against attorneys that you know were litigating you know a motion with you know one little sentence in it over you know two periods or something you know so I wanted something a little bit more exciting than that so then I go to in house and I say you know what I'm going to try in house for a while and see how I like that loved it didn't like the pay <laughs> okay it was not for me I cannot live on that kind of salary. You know, I know myself now. I'm learning about myself. So then I go to, you know, another, you know, business side of the practicing law. So I'm working for a business, and I'm not really practicing law, but I'm advising their compliance department. Pretty good. Just didn't like the company. Wasn't a good fit. You know, then I moved to, you know, a partnership at a large firm in downtown Dallas. Loved that as well. But again, it wasn't what was for me. I wanted more flexibility. If I want to leave in the middle of the day, I'm going to leave in the middle of the day. So I open my own firm and that really lets me select my clients. It lets me pick the times I work. It lets me be with my family. It lets me help people, which is what this profession is truly about. Is you know, There's nothing better than when you get that thank you note from a client that says, oh my God, I can't believe you did this for me. You changed my life. And that happens a lot in what I do now. So really, you know, it's okay if you don't get it right the first time. But the only way you're going to know what is for you is to try different things and really, really just dig your feet in and learn it and understand it. And you know, don't you know, if the partner says, you know what, I need you to stay till two in the morning to write that motion, I was the better for it. I was a better attorney for that. You know, <laughs> so if the partner says, you know what, you've got to you got to work the weekend. You, you know, this is on Monday and gives it to you on a Friday. They stink, but you know what? I learned a lot from that partner. That was my first mentor. <laughs> and I learned how to be a very good lawyer and cross my eyes and dot my T's. And although I hated it at the moment, I am so thankful for it now. Christy, I'll ask if you could say what you enjoy, and then we're going to turn to what's the hardest part about being in solo and small firm practice. Okay. Um, I enjoy two things uh, the relationships, which we sort of already talked about, um, so I won't talk long about it. But what I like about the relationships is there's no air of mystery between the associates and the partners. It's not like this, you know, the lowly associates and the big mean partners that we're all scared of. It's, you know, a bunch of guys that have to be my bosses, but they're also my friends and they're there for advice. And it's much more, uh, you know, stress-free atmosphere. I mean, stressful is the price of law, but you're not stressed about that relationship. And I really like that, um, at least about where I work. And I think a lot of smaller firms would probably like that. 
Um, and second, I've talked about it some already, the experience. I mean, my first day of work, I walked in and they were like, handed me three files. They're like, here's, here's three cases, see if you have questions, you know, and I was like, wow. Um, you know, it's immediate, immediately through the depositions, immediately in court, immediately trying cases. Um, and you just can't get experience like that in a big firm. Um, and that's, those are probably the two, my two favorite things about a small firm, so. The hardest part is, hmm, I don't know what the hardest part is. <laughs> I, I, I just really like where I work. I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Um, you know, uh, I guess less people to talk to about, um, you know, if you have questions and things like that, less people to bounce ideas off of, but my firm's about 30 people, so there's, there's kind of a lot of this to go around. How about the funding? Anybody want to address the hardest part of being worried about where the next client's coming and office overhead, buying your computers, leasing uh, your prop, you know, because your overhead, if you're going to hang out a shingle, is pretty remarkable. So you're talking about a significant loan to get yourself started. So I assume Well, I can tell you, I started with nothing. Um, I was in a situation where when I moved back to Tampa, I did not know a single soul. I did not have a place to put my computer. I had a laptop and I had a phone. And um, immediately I opened up on a kitchen table and I started my practice with nothing. And what, how did I do that? Well. First of all, I started talking to small firms, and I said, do you need help with anything? You know, that's another way to get your foot in the door, contract yourself out. And, and don't think you're going to get paid top dollar. I'll tell you something. My firm started with, you want to know how much I got paid for my first file? The whole file, beginning to end, $10. That is my biggest client today. I cannot have, I, you know, that covers my home firm overhead, all my employees, but I started by taking one file from that person and say, I'll do it for $10. This is what I'm going to do. And boy, they kept giving them to me and giving them to me and giving them to me. And now they won't let me go. So that is the number one thing you can do is your reputation. You know, you don't have to start out getting paid a lot. But once they know that you're knocking that out of the park and you're giving them a good value, you'll have a client for life. You know, so that's probably what I would say is, you know, start small, don't get in over your head, don't take long. I didn't buy anything until I had earned my money for it. So I didn't buy a new computer, I worked off the laptop I had. I didn't, you know, go out and rent office space. I remember when I was signing my first lease for that, um, what do you call it, executive suite. I thought, oh my God, and I got the smallest one, I'm like 5,000 a year. Am I gonna get a client that will cover that? You know, <laughs> you know, I had made that in my first month, but I was still nervous about it, it's very stressful. And it is stressful. There are going to be up and down times. You've got to budget and plan appropriately. Don't get in over your head. You don't need fancy offices. You don't need to be like the lawyers on TV that have, you know, uh, you know, the big ads and everything. Do your work. Do it well. Do it at a good price, and everything will come down the line. As I've indicated, I've been practicing 43 years. For 43 years, the two things I worry about every week are, number one, being able to pay staff. Number two, getting another client. I have never gotten to the place that I have a comfort level and don't worry about those two things. Because most solo and small firms are operate on a contingency basis, contingent upon getting another client and contingent upon <coughs> being paid. Large, medium, and small firms have a common problem in today's climate, accounts receivable. In large firms, what happens is that General Motors or Microsoft or some big company have a case in Charleston, South Carolina. They will call large firm number eight, number one, large firm number two, large firm number three, and they have to bid against each other. Send me a budget on this particular case because they don't even get quality representation from either law firm. And, and the same thing, and some of them now are turning to medium-sized firms and smaller firms and boutique firms because they think they can get it at a cheaper at a cheaper price. And so one, one of the challenges, one of the hardships in, in, the, in a small firm is that you, you've got to make sure that you have more income than you have expenses and that you get paid. A lot of people will tell you, if you're starting out by yourself, be sure to get a good receptionist or a good secretary. 
my advice to you if you're starting out alone, get a good bookkeeper or accountant. Get a bookkeeper or accountant because you've got to make sure that you're, you, you're collecting your fees and you're, you're, you're paying your expenses. But you're getting a reputation that you don't, that you don't pay your bills. It, 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 it's damaging. It's irreparable. You, 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 can't, you, you can't correct it. And so um, the, the hardship is now, because there's so many lawyers, it is very, very competitive. And uh, um, I, I think one of the things is that uh, um, be sure and have a relationship with other uh, lawyers and law firms that when they get a conflict, <coughs> that they will recommend you. And that is, that, is a, that is a source of business that a lot of small and, and medium-sized firms overlook. To, to get, have a relationship with other lawyers, and they 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 will make uh, uh, make referrals. Uh, another source of uh, of, um, of income is, as as Laura has indicated, being active in, in, <coughs> in professional organization. Uh, uh, for, well, for your uh, information, um, the ABA provides free membership the first year out of law school. This, this business is, is, is based on, on networking. Everybody in this room right now is a source of business for the other. So if one of you go practice in Greenville, the other in Myrtle Beach, and the other in Aiken, South Carolina, if they get a case in any of those cities, who are they going to think about? If you have made a good impression on them, they're going to think about you to return to you. But um, the practice of law, just like a roller coaster. It goes up and down, up and down. And one of the keys is when you're up, don't forget about you go down. And so you have to prepare. I, I've seen a lot of lawyers who, uh, you know, on the plaintiff side, gotten a good verdict. And they went out and spent all their money on their Mercedes and on, uh, on alligator shoes or whatever they were doing. And, and then when it hit hard times, they don't have the capital to sustain the bill for those bad times. But it, it, it is really rough out here. But if you're a good lawyer, you can help. Well, I'm going to end on a positive note. But, <laughs> just, but you know, I think it's it's important for us to be candid with you. Yeah. And you know, we we all talk about you know the whole issue of debt collection and credit, and it's so important. You know, before you get out, find out what your score is. Try to keep that score high. You're going to get out. You're going to have loans and other things that you're responsible for. But, you know, firms now can make an inquiry, are, are you credit worthy? Because that may reflect on your ability if you're going to be handling clients' money and, you know, the firm's reputation, you know. So it's important that you get your own house in order while you're still in school and when you get out. But that means, you know, maybe getting a part-time job, setting up a, a program so that you are able to meet your, your debt and uh, be able to move forward. So I, I want to echo something that everybody said about it is hard. It is very difficult. And one of the things as a trial judge that I see is that people come in and they're not prepared. They are f truly not prepared. When you have to sit and ask your client, like, where are you working now? What, do you think that really impresses the judge? <laughs> you know, you're trying to give your allocution and you don't even have the basic. Now, yes, a busy district court practice <laughs> practitioner is running courtroom to courtroom, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So the court can recognize that. But you know, what the judge looks at is even if a person loses a case, what I look at is how prepared the person was. You could have lost. If you're respectful to me, you're not going to sit there and argue. I've, I've overruled the objection. You take it. Or you know, perhaps you said, Your Honor, can I have the basis? Sometimes I brought grades on me, but I will respond to it. And that's an education purpose for you. Oftentimes, as young practitioners, you're going to have somebody on the other side. It's a total jerk. And you're, sometimes you're looking up at me to say, well, are you going to intercede? Are you going to help me? And most likely, I'm not able to help you. What I can do is admonish. I can bring both parties up to the bench and say, we don't need any name call. We don't need any yelling. Move on. Um, you know, or the constant objections with really no basis. I try to cut that off at the pass by somebody who's doing a lot. What is the basis? Because sometimes, clearly, it is just to get you off your game. Because they know that that makes you reflect. But you have to remember the record is your friend. If it takes you five minutes to respond, it seems like an attorney. It is an attorney, five minutes. But I assure you that the record doesn't know that it took you five minutes. So 
you need to have a cheat sheet. In your trial notebook, you should have a trial notebook that has everything in it. First page is going to, you're going to have the courtroom uh, clerk's names, numbers, so that if you're running late that you can call and get a courtroom message put on a file. I hate it when people just appear and then they haven't even advised they're going to be late, so you need to communicate. Number two, you're going to have your hearsay exceptions, right? You're going to have just on a cheat sheet. So when the, the court asks you for a basis, you can look down quickly and be able to respond. You're going to have written out every single question you're going to ask on direct and cross. That's in your trial notebook. Every single question. Why? Because this notebook you're going to bring to every proceeding. You're just going to inter, 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 interplay with the people. And it makes you be succinct in what you're going to ask. Uh, so I, I just really recommend, that's just a tip, and I think a lot of practitioners you use a trial notebook. It's something that you have at each occasion. Um, and you look very professional because it's a three-ring grinder. You put it, it's got all of your information. Make sure your, your uh, exhibits are tagged, show them to the other party. So the court is going to try to assist you uh, if, if the court feels that you're being uh, maligned in some way. But the court is really not able to help you. And sometimes people get their education about judicial process by watching TV. And as I say, you know, speaking publicly, Judge Judy, Hatcher, everybody, they would be in judicial disabilities in a heartbeat. No judge is supposed to make fun of a person, to laugh at a person, to be demeaning and condescending to a person. But when you have a pro se litigant on the other side, which many of you will, you've got to be confident enough that you're not going to go down to the lowest level. Like I'm going to judge, they haven't done what they're supposed to do. Just get your point across, but not to the, because then it, the judge is human. And it's a balancing test. We're not supposed to assist. But when somebody's totally beating up on somebody for no reason, um, and as I said, my court is the, the lower of the trial courts, then I do have a degree of empathy for that individual. So, and I said we're going to end on a positive note. I know we have five minutes. We want to do our raffle. Um, but um, one of the things, uh, Laura, did you have something? Uh, yeah, I, I was going to say one more thing, a couple more things. Um, I think it's really important to have a mentor. Um, and you can have mentors at different phases of your practice, but especially for solos that are hanging out there on the shingle. And, you know, one thing is to be a lawyer, another thing is to be a business person. It's, you know, lawyers don't get training to be a business person necessarily. And opening up your own shop or working in a smaller firm, you need to develop business knowledge and business savvy. How do I run a business? And having people you can turn to, that you can talk to, that you can get advice from, whether it's in the practice area or whether it's on business is crucial. And so I would encourage you to seek that out on a regular basis. By the way, we have a listserv, I don't know if any of you have heard of it, it's called Solo Says, which is fabulous, it's free. And the General Practice Solo Small Firm uh, Division sponsors it. And it's kind of like the water cooler, virtual water cooler talk, where people can go and seek advice on everything from how to set up a firm and maybe what billing software to buy or something related to technology technology, which is also crucial and important to kind of keep in the playing field for solos and smalls that are maybe going up against a big firm. But use that because you'll see that there's some valuable, valuable tips that you will get. And it's national. It's from all over the country. Sometimes you can even get business out of it. Or does anyone know a lawyer in such and such that might help in such and such case? So I encourage you to check that out. But on those fronts, I think if you can stay uh, and try to stay up to speed, and for all of you on technology, that should be easy. You guys are just pros in technology. I know because my kids are, you know, loading apps onto my iPad, and I'm like, I don't even know where this comes from or what this does, and they, oh, mom, this is really easy. I know you're all way ahead of us. At least I'm making that assumption. Stay on top of the technology because as the practice develops, it will give you a leg up, and it will help you run your office more efficiently. I think with that, we're going to try to answer any questions that you would have. We do have the, the uh, material that the services for law students and uh, a little bit about GP and our, our magazine. So I, I encourage you, what Laura said about, I look around this room, when I met Christy, I just met Christy. Um, Christy's been in practice for three years here in Charleston. I was a young lawyer 30 years ago. I was very active in the ABA Young Lawyers. I was an officer. But 30 years ago, I have, because of that network, every single state in the United States, I know somebody. I asked her if she knew somebody that I know that it lives in here, and of course, she knew that individual. Um, and so, and I believe that Ricky and IS and Laura were talking about somebody that, in Tampa. So all I'm saying is the connections that you make are so very important. 
Um, so with that, Kim, you want to help us with the um, with the raffle? And Matt, do you want to? Oh, Mark. Mark. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Mark. That's a lot of pressure. Uh, okay. You can beat him up. And please take another sandwich. If you have any Yes, you can. One. Yes. Yes, you can. And by the way, we're meeting here. Our division is here. We're at the Double Tree Suites. If you want to come by, we're having some, we're going to have some CLEs tomorrow and some other things, some young lawyer activities. You're welcome to come. Uh, I encourage you to swing by. We will be there through Sunday morning. Uh, but most of the activities will be uh, tomorrow, Friday, and some activities on Saturday. So if you get a chance, double tree sweeps. So dress up, come on over. We'd love to have you. <laughs> this <up>. Megan Croft. <laughs> oh, yeah, Megan. The book that we're doing the Warrior's Guide to Negotiation. Um, so, well, good luck to you all. Please, you know, you have four people that you met by today. Uh, we're in the, uh, we're in and around. We'll be here all weekend. If you have any questions or you'd like to, to ask us to come and chat, we would be happy to meet with you. I did hear that somebody wanted to join our division today. Feel free to do that. And Kim is here to assist you with that. Thank you, Thank you all so much.